a very hard time. Uh, there's just such a concentration of resources and power that uh, uh, you know, alternative media, while extremely important, are uh, going to have quite a battle. It's true there are things which are small successes, but it's because people have just been willing to put in incredible effort. Like say, take Z Magazine. I mean, that's a national magazine which literally has a staff of two and no resources. Tell us a little about Z Magazine, what it is and what makes it different. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We just wanted to do a magazine that would address all the sides of political life, economics, race, gender, authority, political relations. And we wanted to do it in a way that would incorporate an attention to how to not only understand what's going on, but how to make things better, what to aim toward, and uh, to provide at the same time humor, culture, a kind of a magazine that people could relate to and could get a lot out of and could participate in. And what we wanted to do, which we didn't think was provided by the existing magazines, was to give it a real activist slant so that it could be very useful to the variety of uh, movements in the country. And we just felt there wasn't a magazine that reflected that, that inspired people and that gave people sort of a, a strategy and perhaps even a vision of how things could be better. South End Press has sort of made it. Uh, that is, they're surviving. It's a small collective, again, with no resources, and they put out a lot of books, including quite a lot of good books. But for a South End book to get reviewed is almost impossible. Editorially and um, business-wise, we make decisions based on um, a politics that no corporate publisher can really um, advocate because of their ties to corporate America. We can solicit manuscripts based on what we feel is the relevance for the movement, and we can make our business decisions based on whether we feel people can afford our books, whether we feel that a book uh, might not make that much money, but it needs to be out there, and maybe there is a thousand people who would buy it. And those are criteria that we feel are very precious in this day of, of corporate mergers. Well, and likewise, our structure about sharing work and continuing our training process as long as we're at the press, there are losses there in terms of productivity. But in terms of empowerment, all of us are then able to say, my perspective is different from yours. Then all of our intelligence gets used in making those decisions and not just whoever happens to have done it the longest, whoever happens to uh, have graduated from the best schools in order to be the best editor, making all the decisions and only using his or her intelligence. Listener supported radio in the United States has undergone a remarkable growth in the last decade. Uh, it's perhaps the fastest growing alternative media. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, first and foremost is that it's enormously economical and it reaches communities that have not been served by community radio before. And in Boulder particular, we see with someone like uh, Noam Chomsky, who's been there, I believe, three times in the last six years, uh, he has a tremendous audience. And KGNU is partly responsible for that because we play his tapes on a regular ba basis. We play his lectures and his interviews. So when he does come to Boulder and people hear what he has to say, they're able to tune in. It's not something exotic or esoteric that he's talking about. It's material that they're very familiar with. And he's noted this, incidentally. I mean, if there's a listener-supported radio station, you're, that means that people can get daily, every day, a different way of looking at the world, not just what the corporate media want you to see, but a different picture, a different understanding. Not only can you hear it, but you can participate in it. You can add your own thoughts, you know, and you can learn something and so on. Well, that's the way uh, people become uh, human, you know. That's the way you become human participants in a in a social and political system. Hello, I'm Ed Robinson, and this is Non-Corporate News. What is Non-Corporate News, and why is it necessary? I didn't want to just show another film at a library or something. I wanted to make my own statement. I thought it would be more fun to do, and perhaps I could get other people involved in a, in a project besides 
showing a film, we could, we could make a film or a video. The local cable stations hooked up to three communities, Lynn, Swampscott, and Salem. So that's 30,000 people, it, or 30,000 homes, I'm not sure, but I'm sure a lot of people will see it, and it'll be the kind of people who don't go out to, to see a film. It'll go right into their houses, so if they're flipping through the channels, they might be able to get a completely new idea of the world. So there's kind of networks of cooperation developed, which, I mean, like here, for example, is a collection of stuff from a friend of mine in Los Angeles who uh, does careful monitoring of the whole press in Los Angeles and a lot of the British press, which he reads, uh, and uh, sele does selection, so I don't have to read the, you know, the movie reviews and the local gossip and all this kind of stuff, but I get the occasional nugget that sneaks through and that you find if you're carefully and intelligently and critically reviewing a wide range of press. Well, there are a fair number of people who do this, and we exchange information. We wrote this a two-volume work in which we saw one another for a couple of weeks when we were getting started, but then we wrote two volumes, essentially, without seeing one another, just uh, by phone, by, by mail, and uh, exchanging manuscripts. And, but this takes a lot of, a lot of uh, communication by mail. My, my Chomsky file is a couple of feet thick. The end result is that you do have access to resources in a way which I doubt that any national intelligence agency can duplicate a little on scholarship. So there are ways of compensating for the uh, absence of resources. People can do things. Like, for example, I found out about the arms flow to Iran by reading transcripts of the BBC hmm. uh, and by reading uh, an interview somewhere with an Israeli ambassador in one city and reading something else in the Israeli press. Now, okay, the information is there, hmm. but it's there to a fanatic, you know, somebody who hmm. wants to uh, spend a substantial part of their time and energy exploring it and comparing today's lies with yesterday's leaks and so on. That's a research mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it just simply doesn't make any sense to ask the uh, general population to dedicate themselves to this task on every issue. I'm not given to false modesty. There are mm. things that I can do, and I mm. know that I can do them reasonably well, uh, including uh, uh, analysis mm. and, uh, you know, uh, uh, study, research. I mean, I know how to do that sort yeah. of thing, and I think I have a reasonable understanding of the way the world uh, works as much as anyone can. Yeah. And that turns out to be a very useful resource for people who are, uh, uh, who are doing active organizing, uh, 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 trying to uh, engage themselves in a way which will make it a little bit of a better world. Uh, and if you can help in those things or mm. participate in them, well, that's, uh, you know, that's rewarding. I wonder if you can envision a time when people uh, like myself, uh, again, the naive people of this world, can again take pride in the United States. And is that even a healthy wish now? Because it may be this hunger uh, for pride in our country that makes us more easily manipulated by the powers that you talk about. Uh, I think you first of all have to ask what you mean by your country. Now, if you mean by the country, the government, I don't think you can be proud of it, and I don't think you could ever be proud of it. Or it couldn't be proud of any government. It's not our government. You know. uh, and you shouldn't be. States are violent institutions. They, the government of any country, including ours, represents some sort of domestic power structure, and it's usually violent. States are violent to the extent that they're powerful. That's roughly accurate. You look at American history, it's nothing to write home about. You know, why are we here? We're here because, say, some 10 million Native Americans were wiped out. That's not very pretty. Until the 1960s, it was still cowboys and Indians. In the 1970s, for the first time, really, it became possible even for scholarship to try to deal with the facts as they were. For example, to deal with the fact that the Native American population was far higher than had been claimed, millions higher, maybe as many as 10 million higher than had been claimed, and that they had an advanced civilization, and that there was something akin to genocide that took place. Now, we went through 200 years of our history without facing that fact. Uh, one of the effects of the 1960s is it's possible to at least begin to come to, to think about the facts. Well, that's an advance. 
Do you think that this activism 20 years ago has made a difference in how our society